Kenya to Colombia, from Iraq to Korea, in slums, in schools, in prisons, and in theaters. Every day, people gather at TEDx events around the world to hear the best ideas bubbling up in their communities. Today, you are part of a global conversation about our shared future. So what is this TEDx? TEDx is an initiative of the TED Conference, a nonprofit devoted to ideas worth spreading. We grant free licenses to allow TED-like events to spread globally. This event today is based on the TED Conference format and ideals, but is independently organized by your local community. So please make sure to thank the team of volunteers who worked so hard on today's event. It's their ideas, dedication, and time that made it all possible. It's they who booked all the speakers. And the views you'll hear today are, of course, those of those speakers, not necessarily of TEDs. But we hope their talks spark an exciting conversation among you. This is a day for curiosity and for skepticism, for openness and for critical thinking inspiration and for action. The more you enter into it, the more you'll take out. And now, on with the show. Hi everyone, I'm Chris Johnson and I'm Pro Vice Chancellor for Engineering and Physical Sciences here at Queen's University Belfast. I'd like to welcome you to this TEDx event, which is about engineering our sustainable future. Um, first of all, I'd like to introduce Queen's. Um, it's a civic university based in the heart of Belfast. It's one of the most, uh, I think, beautiful universities in the world. Hopefully you'll, you'll have seen images of it. If not, go look, look it up online. Um, we have an international reputation for um, innovation and entrepreneurialism, appearing in the top 10 uh, universities for that. Uh, we're a member of the Russell Group, research leading universities within the UK, and we're also in the world top 20 for our international outlook. So hopefully that will encourage you to come and visit Belfast one day and, uh, and take up some of the things that will be, will be mentioned in the talk and the talks that you see after this. Um, I think one of the most important defining factors and part of the reason why I came to Queen's is that uh, Queen's is a civic university and a civic university at its heart is about understanding the local environment and population, servicing the needs of the people that effectively support our, our work in education and research, but then also helping them to have a global outreach um, and that, that occurs in both directions. So also welcoming people from other countries into Queens to help us work on global problems. Now, obviously sustainability is one of those key problem areas, not just for Belfast, but for the world. And within the idea of a civic university, I'd like to kind of identify two engineering challenges that we face. So one would be the the creating sustainable power and creating sustainable in infrastructures for the urban environment. As a specific example of a local challenge that has a global impact, uh, Northern Ireland is in a great position in terms of renewables. We, we generate about 16% more renewable power than we can actually transmit to the points of need within our existing infrastructure. Now we can address that and solve that through different mechanisms. So one way would be, for instance, to, to convert uh, electrical energy generated by wind power into hydrogen and then find ways of using that hydrogen either in vehicles or, or to, uh, to maintain the power supply in domestic, domestic uh, contexts. Um, but then that creates other costs in terms of the delivery of that energy and it creates engineering challenges in ensuring that those, those uh, infrastructures are safe. Um, and so there's an awful lot of engineering to actually achieve our ambitions for net zero within the urban context. Um, the other problem I would raise that is a, that is a particular concern for, for Queen's University at the moment is the, the agriculture that is a significant employer within Northern Ireland. And it generates or is responsible for the generation of carbon through the natural processes that we use to feed our people. Um, 
And unless we can address that, then it's going to be very difficult, you know, either through reduction of the carbon generation within farming or offsetting it in other ways, it's going to be very difficult to achieve net zero. Now, these are, these are specific local issues that we focus on, but actually they occur globally. Um, and not only is that global perspective in the way that the behaviors or the industry that we have here in Northern Ireland affects the rest of the world, but the problems of transmission of renewable power, the problems of a sustainable agriculture that provides sufficient yields and sufficient food to keep everybody fed is absolutely central to, to the, the future of the, the sustainable development goals globally. Um, and, I, and I would say that one of the things that characterizes what we do is that we, we do take a hard engineering look at these problems. Um, because often what we're dealing with is not single innovations, but systems. We need to provide energy in a way that consumers can use, and that is sustainable, um, without creating safety concerns. And these things all interact, and that, that is a, a particular challenge to the world going forward. Sustainability is not about individual point innovations in any, for any individual field of science and engineering. So as a faculty here, we absolutely work together to solve these local problems and then these global problems within the context of, of Queen's University. So I hope you really enjoy these talks. I hope they provoke thought. And now I'm going to hand over to Professor Sue Taylor, who is going to introduce the speakers in more detail. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sue Taylor. I'm a professor of structural engineering here at Queen's University Belfast and absolutely delighted to be here for our third online TEDx event as I'm passionate about the impact that our research can make in securing a sustainable world. This time our theme is engineering our sustainable future and we have focused on speakers from my own faculty, the Faculty of Engineering and Physical Sciences. What an amazing afternoon this promises to be. Now, as we know, TED is an organization that aims to bring together the world's leading thinkers and doers to provoke conversations that matter. And provoking conversations that matter, focus on the needs of our society, is at the very heart of Queen's University. At Russell Group University, Queen's is the ninth oldest university in the UK and is ranked in the top 200 universities in the world. In 2017, the university launched its social charter the Charter reaffirms the university's commitment to engaging with society and celebrates the many ways that our students and staff contribute to our place. I am proud that here at Queen's University, the work, study, teaching and research undertaken by our staff and students has a tangible impact on our society at home and across the world in life-changing ways. We have a superb lineup of talented speakers this afternoon including eight brand new TEDx talks, as well as memorable ones from previous Queen's TEDx events. Every single speaker participating in the TEDx has close links to the university and specifically to the Faculty of Engineering and Physical Sciences. I know that I speak on behalf of Queen's when I say a huge thank you to them for the time and the commitment that they have given to the individual talks and to this event. And finally, before we start with our first talk of the afternoon, I want to ask you to get involved in the conversation. As we've heard, TEDx is all about provoking conversations. And one way which we can do that is to help do this via social media. On the online event programme, you can check out the titles of each of the talks and the running order and the short bio for each of the participants. You will also find the, the list of their speakers' Twitter handles and our own Twitter and Instagram links. Let's all follow our speakers, tweet their key messages, share your thoughts and opinions, and let's finally embrace the spirit of TED.
Now I'm delighted to introduce our very first TEDx talk of the afternoon. Well known across the world in his field, David Rooney is a professor of chemical engineering and dean of internationalization and reputation here at Queen's University Belfast. His research focuses on energy generation and materials. At present, he works with oil and gas companies, regional industry and government to advise on zero carbon technologies. You'll not be surprised to hear the title of his TED talk. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Professor David Rooney with Why We Need Zero Carbon Engineers. Hello, my name is David Rooney and I'm a professor of chemical engineering at Queen's University Belfast. I think I've always been an engineer. I've always been curious about how things work and what I can do with that knowledge. Even as a child, I would dream of finding an advanced piece of technology which would provide me with the answer to any question I asked. Roll on a few decades and my dream seems to have come true. I can now speak to my computer, my phone, or even my watch and ask it anything. But if I was to ask Google, how do I solve global challenges? It would respond with over 400 million suggestions, enough reading for several thousand years. On reflection, maybe I should have dreamt of having the wisdom to know the right questions to ask, as well as understand the answers. Knowing the right question to ask would be very useful. The American inventor Charles Kettering once said, a problem well stated is a problem half solved. The idea being that once properly framed, you can apply knowledge and skill to produce a solution. I cover this in my own teaching and it works. Sketch out the problem, see the connections, apply the tools, and you're done. But what about those really big challenges? The types of challenges that come when we set out to design, support, and deliver a sustainable future for all. These challenges are hugely complex interconnected, interdependent. Even attempts to propose a solution requires more skill, more awareness, something more nuanced than anything that's come before. Instead of thinking of these challenges as a treasure hunt trying to find that X within a formula, we need to think of them as complex systems connecting people, nature, and technology. We need to take the ideas behind systems thinking, uh, sprinkle in some chaos theory, behavioral science, creativity. It's certainly not clear to where to begin, but making those first steps is important. They're important because all 17 of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals are a complex mix of economic, social, and environmental sustainability issues. Number seven on that list is clean and affordable energy. Energy, at least to me, is critical. If you can secure a supply of clean, affordable, and plentiful energy, you can do a lot more than just turn on the lights. You can purify contaminated water, take that water and turn it into hydrogen, take that hydrogen and air and make fertilizer, and so on. My own research centers on energy. It started with vegetable oils, moved into crude oils, and now focuses on bioenergy and zero carbon systems. Carbon, well, carbon has become probably the most well-known, if not infamous, element on the periodic table, rising up the watch lists of governments around the world. Yet at the same time, carbon is the basic building block of life. We are all carbon powered but we have overconsumed, leading to global impacts. A balance needs to be struck. Nature needs carbon, we need carbon, but unlike the rest of nature, we do need to go on a carbon diet. It can all be quite confusing. The idiom at sixes and sevens is a term used to represent a state of confusion, a disagreement between parties. It is coincidental that carbon, number six on the periodic table, is at odds with energy, number seven, on the list of sustainable development goals. Even more coincidental, when six is added to seven, you get 13, the number given to climate change on that same list. We can, of course, disconnect carbon from energy. 
And we are making great progress. The cost of wind and solar and geothermal and tidal energy is dropping. The installed capacity of these renewable sources increasing. As a result, our addiction to cheap carbon is waning. But these are all still technological tools. The relatively low-hanging fruit of the zero carbon journey. Having tools does help, but we also need to know what to do with them. At home, I have a box filled with widgets and spare parts, things left over from long forgotten projects. Beside it sits my toolbox, filled with spanners and screwdrivers, drill bits and saws of various sizes. When I have a new and unfamiliar problem to solve and initiate that treasure hunt for a solution, I find myself searching through that box of widgets for inspiration. I already know the types of tools I'll need. What I'm looking for is how to put it all together. My treasure hunt does not start off by looking for the X on the map. It starts by looking for the map itself. Making maps takes science and technical skill as well as design and aesthetics. It presents complex information clearly and has helped people over the centuries to plan their own journeys into the unknown. Mapping out the terrain of zero carbon is similar. It too also requires more than just science and equations. For example, I already know that when it comes to energy conversion, a wind turbine is so much more efficient than a tree, but I still see beauty in a tree. I know there is economic value trapped up in a range of carbon-rich materials, yet in society we too often just casually throw them away. We do need to understand how and why and what we value. But clearly money isn't everything, and yet we know our journey is going to be expensive. Who will invest in our zero carbon expedition, knowing that their investment is at serious risk? The more complex the journey, the higher the risk, particularly if nature is going to be involved. And yet there are financial tools which embrace risk, tools whereby contracts are created giving stability and confidence to investors. Stability in business is good, but again, this has to be more than just business. In his TEDx talk, Edward Freeman speaks about how business is about purpose, the importance of ethics and stakeholders, the idea that we all just get on better together when we are aligned in terms of what we want to achieve. When we bring all of these ideas together, it starts to reveal a terrain which is in balance with nature and technology and economics and value and purpose. When it comes to zero carbon, what we want to achieve is balance. Perhaps contracts with nature which are focused on mutual benefit, adding value and return on our shared investment. Engineering has always been about adding value to society, and zero carbon engineering is no different. What we need now is a new generation of engineers, clever people who can combine their own awareness and skills to give them the wisdom to know the right questions to ask, to understand the answers, and to draw out a new map for our sustainable future. Thank you. Thank you, David. Our next speaker hails from the School of Natural and Built Environment. Emma Campbell is a research fellow and design tutor in architecture. Her research focuses on future relationships between people, food and places through the lens of sustainability, which leads us nicely to her TEDx talk. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Emma Campbell with, can bees help us design sustainable supermarkets? Have you ever thrown out a bottle of runny honey because it was taking too long to squeeze that last bit out? I'll admit it, I've definitely done that before. But I recently found out that the average worker bee only produces about a twelfth of a teaspoon of honey throughout its entire life. Those last few drops that I couldn't be bothered to squeeze out equate to the life work of dozens of bees. Just wasted. That really struck me. 
we rarely think of the backstory of our food when we shop for it. And I think a lot of that relates to the places in which we shop. As an architectural researcher and designer, I'm really interested in how spaces are designed for disconnection and the social and environmental implications of this. This disconnection between people, food and place is a relatively new phenomenon. That's because early cities would have evolved next to areas of fertile land called a hinterland. And it was within this zone that nearly all the city's food was grown. As the city and hinterland were physically connected, these early settlements were circular in nature. Food would have been produced and consumed locally, and waste would have been collected to produce more food, while packaging would have been continuously reused. Where circular systems help resources to move in continuous loops, contemporary food supply chains are longer and much more linear. Due to advances in refrigeration, packaging and logistics, today our hinterland is the size of the whole world and we encounter it every time we zoom through our local supermarket. Here in the UK, supermarkets are the primary interface between us and those global supply chains. Amazingly, just nine retailers control over 95% of the grocery market. And I have to admit, supermarkets do provide us with a convenient shopping experience. But this comes with huge and largely unseen environmental cost. Firstly, around 45% of our food is imported from outside the UK. Moving food around the world means that it's difficult to avoid single-use packaging, and most of our food is still wrapped in it. And despite the value of packaging to lengthen shelf life, still around a third of all food produced is just thrown away. This cannot be acceptable. As our climate changes and resources become scarcer, we urgently need to reconnect with our food and consume more sustainably. To do this, I think we need to look again at supermarkets. As a researcher, I've spent the last few years really trying to understand this complex problem. And as a designer, I've also become interested in testing some supermarket-led solutions. Looking back to the early city and its relationship to hinterland, I started to think about how the principles of circularity might help supermarkets become more sustainable. I thought to myself, what would a truly circular supermarket look like? How would it operate? The only way that I could begin to answer some of those questions was by designing one. So I did, and I imagined it to be a bit like a beehive. You see, bees can only source as far as they can fly. It's back to that idea of city and hinterland again. A truly circular supermarket would have to start by radically localizing food supply again. In doing so, it would no longer be a node along a global supply chain, Instead, it would be more like a hub or a beehive, hosting a mini food system inside it. You see, this supermarket wouldn't just be a place to buy food. It would also be a place to grow it, to preserve it, to package it, to cook it, and to even eat it. This supermarket would also help to close waste streams in its local neighbourhood. A worker bee mobility fleet would deliver and collect from local homes, bringing waste back to the supermarket to produce energy and food. This whole system would be underpinned by a separation of food and packaging. 
That means no more single-use plastic and a return to either biodegradable honeycomb or a reusable honeypot. A bit like a library loan scheme, shoppers could check in and out packaging so that when it returned to store, it could be cleaned for reuse. This circular supermarket would rely heavily on a renewed culture of sharing within neighbourhoods. Sharing of packaging, as well as mobility, energy, food waste, time and skills. The store loyalty card would be reinvented as a platform for shoppers to share with each other as well as the supermarket. But for any of this to work, local people would have to buy into a hive mentality and play their part to make food systems more sustainable. So, how would this new food system be more sustainable than the one we already have? Well, by localising production and consumption, food and packaging waste could be eliminated. And food miles could be reduced from a journey across a continent to a journey across a city. Vitally, by bringing the hinterland into the city, this system would enable people to reconnect with food again. This circular supermarket benefits from a big dose of blue sky thinking. Of course, it's radical and it's certainly not grounded in today's reality. But in a climate emergency, we need big ideas because we know that today's reality won't look very much like tomorrow's. We can no longer just patch up broken systems. Instead, we need to imagine new ones. Ones that enable reconnection with our environment and each other. If we want a more sustainable supermarket, if we want a more sustainable future, we need to think like bees and design it together. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. Next up is chemical engineer PhD candidate. Ralph Lavery is currently researching how to develop sustainable energy systems to facilitate a faster transition away from fossil-based fuels for heat and energy production in a range of sizes and applications. His talk is about ammonia. I'll let him tell you the rest. Here is Ralph Lavery with his TEDx talk. It's complicated the history of ammonia and the human race. So today I'm going to talk about ammonia. It's a rather smelly, but invisible gas that consists of a nitrogen atom bonded to three hydrogen atoms in a pyramidal structure. This gas underpins a large amount of the things we take for granted in modern life, from farming to fashion. But our relationship with it began thousands of years in the past with a civilization that was more concerned with great pyramids than microscopic ones, the ancient Egyptians. In the Siwa oasis in modern day Libya, Pliny the Elder tells of the temple of Zeus Ammon, where the priests there used ammonium chloride, a salt containing ammonia and chlorine, for their medicinal and religious practices on the site. And in Rome, the togas that we associate as being so white and clean used urine derived from ammonia to clean and bleach those garments. This became such a widespread practice in the city that in 79 CE, Emperor Vespasian declared urine vectigal, or a urine tax, to deal with this issue and turn the smelly collection of urine in the city into a monetary gain for the empire. By the 10th century CE, ammonium chloride was being traded from the Far East to Europe along the Silk Road, along with the commodities like spices and silk we associate with that path today. 
these natural sources of ammonia were very useful to our ancestors, but it's not how we produce ammonia in modern life. That process began in 1904 with uh, Fritz Haber developing a chemical synthesis to make ammonia from nitrogen from the air and hydrogen. And along with a fellow German compatriot, Karl Bosch, in 1914, they commissioned the first Haber-Bosch processing plant to produce ammonia for the war effort for Germany in World War I. This was necessary because the British had blockaded the ports that the German Empire used to import guano, a natural source of ammonia, from South America. And while this was quite a controversial start for synthetic ammonia production, it revolutionized farming and textiles in the 20th century. This was because of the excess uh, nitrogen available from the synthetic ammonia. It was used to create the fertilizers that we use in modern farming, which increased the yields of crops around the world. This resulted in millions of people being lifted out of food poverty and insecurity. And further to this, the availability of this cheap ammonia resulted in the creation of synthetic fibers such as nylon that we're all familiar with today. By the 1930s, ammonia had become such a useful chemical to us as a species that we were using it in refrigeration practices. And what this meant was we were able to increase the shelf life of foods and medicines around the world, which meant that they were more able to get to the people that need them. This is where my personal journey with ammonia began, researching sustainable and alternative refrigeration methods at Queen's. Ammonia has been used for a long time, and we are coming back to considering using it as an alternative to the modern HFCs and CFCs we use in our air conditioners and freezers today. But ammonia is used for much more than that. We use it to make our food, we use it to make our clothes as well, and this has created a network that produces 176 million tons of ammonia every year. That number is a little bit obscure, so to put that into perspective, the only things we make more of every year on the planet are cement and steel. Along with the other large chemicals that we produce, there's an associated environmental impact from this process. The energy and the electricity we use and the feedstock that we get our hydrogen from all derive from fossil fuels, mostly coal and natural gas. And these have an associated carbon emission that equates to 300 million extra tons of CO2 entering our atmosphere every year. That's about equivalent to the entire global shipping sector that moves all the goods we use as a species around the planet every year. And that's a huge amount. But ammonia presents a unique opportunity in this group of massive chemicals that we produce, in that it contains no carbon. It only contains nitrogen and hydrogen. So the carbon that we use is further up in the process. And if we can remove that by decarbonizing the electricity production, by using solar, wind, geothermal, or tidal energy to supply it, and we create the hydrogen we use to make it, using technologies such as fuel cells to split water into hydrogen and oxygen, we can secure and make a more sustainable future for food production and textile production in modern life. This opportunity is something that we need to grasp, as ammonia is one of the only chemicals we produce at this scale that doesn't contain carbon. And what it will do is it will allow us to enter the next revolution that this very smelly friend of ours can present to us, the energy revolution. One of the main problems we're having right now with transitioning from carbon-based energy production to hydrogen-based is hydrogen is very volatile and very dangerous when stored or handled. It also has the issue that we don't have the infrastructure or the network we need to produce it at, in the amounts that we need to create the energy that we all use every day. But ammonia presents an opportunity to sidestep those issues. We already transport it in vast quantities around the world. And over the last century, we've developed a network of production and handling that's only rivaled by natural gas. 
if we use ammonia and its three hydrogen atoms as a hydrogen vector to transport hydrogen around the planet, we can overcome these hurdles and more quickly decarbonize our energy production as a species. So despite being a very old and very smelly friend, ammonia is constantly updating its relationship status with us to a more sustainable future that we can all enjoy. Thank you. Thank you, Ralph. Our fourth talk this afternoon is a double act. Dr. Gary McCoon and Dr. Magdalena Ryszkowska both lecture in the School of Psychology. Gary's area of expertise is effective computing. This is getting computers to simulate and be responsive to emotional and social signals that humans make when they communicate with one another. Magdalena's research focuses on emotion and social signals, in particular smiles and laughter, which are among the most common and yet most understudied human expression. When you put these two areas of expertise together, you get this TEDx talk. Without further ado, Dr. Gary McCoon and Dr. Magdalena Ryszkowska with Teaching Algorithms Responsibly, Lessons from Cold Spaghetti and Emotional Research. Hello, my name is Gary McCune. Hi, I'm Magda Rychowska. We want you to think about putting your hand into a bowl of cold spaghetti. A bowl of cold spaghetti with a nice cold sauce. We want you to think about giving a good squidge around in that imaginary spaghetti with your hand. Now we want you to think about what is happening on your face whenever you do this. Why would we ask you to do such a strange thing? Well, we're psychologists and we work in the field of emotion, social interaction, and emotional computing, which is technically known as affective computing. That emotional computing is getting computers to recognize emotional states and sometimes imitate emotional states. Our role as psychologists is to explain and understand emotion and sometimes to generate uh, emotional activity that can be used to train artificial intelligence algorithms. We use a lot of strange equipment whenever we do this, and one of those pieces of equipment is the cold spaghetti. And what we do is we get a box, and we cut a hole in the top of the box, and we put the spaghetti inside the box. And we get people uh, who don't know what's inside the box, and we ask them to put their hands in the box and have a good feel around. What we're doing here is we're trying to generate feelings of disgust. And we want to observe people's reactions and particularly their facial expressions when they have this feeling of disgust. When we did it for the first time, what we expected to see was this face. And this is because of a very famous psychological theory by Paul Ekman, according to which when a person feels disgust, they make a disgust face. They would wrinkle their nose, they will raise their upper lip, and other emotions like happiness, sadness, or surprise come with their own special emotion faces. This theory claims that our face shows our emotion like a thermometer shows heat. So if a person is looking like this, this is also a reliable sign that they feel disgust. Now, what does this theory have to do with computing? The theory is behind most of the algorithms that are now being marketed as able to understand our emotion. And these emotion algorithms are in our phones, in our cars, they are used in schools, they are even used by governments for surveillance and for prisoner tracking. Soon they will be everywhere. These emotion recognition algorithms are developed using the techniques from artificial intelligence and machine learning. And we think that there's a lesson from Emotion AI that should be extended to the whole of thinking about artificial intelligence and machine learning. In the AI world, there's a lot of emphasis placed on the learning that these algorithms do. And it is amazing that these algorithms do a kind of learning. It's kind of mind blowing when you think about it. But in our amazement at this, we think we miss a crucial point. And that is that these machines are being taught as well as doing the learning. 
We as scientists and researchers provide the data to these algorithms for them to learn. And we train them to make the connections between the examples and the labels that we give them. In facial emotion recognition, we might give examples as facial expressions, and then our theories would suggest a set of labels that we can give to the algorithms. We think that this machine teaching part of the process needs a lot more attention, and the data that we give to these algorithms needs much more care and scrutiny. Let's go back to the theory about our feelings always showing on our faces. Computer scientists really love this theory because it's simple. How does it work? So imagine a person feeling, seeing something really, really beautiful, like a puppy. Obviously, the person is going to feel puppy bliss and they will smile. So an algorithm can then scan this person's face, detect the smile, and make the decision. This person is feeling puppy bliss. If a person is wrinkling their nose, the algorithm will decide that the person is feeling disgust. And a computer scientist can then teach the algorithm by showing it a lot of smiles, a lot of disgust faces, or other emotion expressions. So what could go wrong with this approach? It does turn out quite a lot, and this is because what we use to teach our algorithms are facial expressions that are acted. They are acted on demand to fit big categories, like happiness, sadness, surprise, anger. And these expressions and these labels are not necessarily representative of what people do in real life. We want to provide a note of caution when it comes to these algorithms because the real world can rarely be accurately described by a simple set of labels. What we see when we get people to put their hands into a bowl of spaghetti is really a complicated set of facial expressions, not just that classic disgust facial expression. We do see flashes of that kind of expression, but we also see smiles and laughter. We see confusion. It's a dynamic picture that changes back and forth very quickly. There's a complex set of interrelationships between facial expression, any verbal communication that's happening, and a shared awareness of the social context in which the events are taking place. The social and emotional complexities of our real lives are not being reflected in the algorithms, uh, in the things, the assumptions that we are teaching to these algorithms. So what do we have to do? We have to teach our algorithms using spontaneous emotion faces. And we have to teach diversity. Diversity in faces, because the algorithms that we have are worse with faces of women, ethnic minorities, and people from non-Western countries. We also need to teach diversity in feelings, because what we feel doesn't always have to show on our face. And diversity in feelings, because people don't have to feel about things the same way. Some people, for example, enjoy touching cold spaghetti. They don't get disgusted. And some other people, I like to call them monsters, don't even like puppies. So if we push all this complexity into a few narrow boxes, we get to simplistic or even dangerous solutions. Imagine, for example, that an algorithm decides that frowning means that you have done something bad. But we frown for so many different reasons, right? So maybe it's safer to avoid claiming that our algorithms can understand emotion and stick with what algorithms can do. Analyze the shapes and movements of our faces. And this is great, but algorithms are only as good as what we teach them. They will not replace us in answering hard questions, like, what does this person feel? Can I trust them? Will they pay their bills? We think that the lesson from emotion AI is that we need to be much more aware that we are active teachers of artificial intelligence. And as a society, we have to request that our algorithms are taught responsibly in terms of theory and in terms of representation. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, Gary and Magdalena. Now, our next talk is an old one, but a good one. We thought we would look back on some of our great TEDx acts from previous TEDx Queen's University Belfast events, and some of you may not have already seen. And this one from a student from the Faculty of Engineering and Physical Sciences was at the top of our list. Delfina Bilea was born in Argentina and grew up in Italy. She spent her teenage years in Spain before moving to Belfast to study psychology at Queen's. She explored the dark triad of psychopathy, Machiavellianism and narcissism within the interdisciplinary research in the Resilience and Cognition Laboratory. This emerging field helped her develop a different perspective on personality whereby seemingly negative traits can provide some advantages. And with that, we have the title of her talk from TEDx QUB event, Outside In in 2019, let's look back at Delfano Bileo and her talk, What Would Happen If We Were All Narcissists? Hope y'all were fed, because I'm going to ask you a question. What would you prefer? Always being taken advantage of for being too good, or never being taken advantage of for being too selfish? Well, this is an extreme case where we're constantly encountering these conundrums in our everyday lives. And as situations vary, so does our response to them. Things are not as black and white, and our categorical view in which good things can never be bad and bad things can never be good doesn't do us any favors. This is also true of our preconceptions of narcissism. We believe it's something that we either have or we haven't, and if we have it, then we shouldn't. If we put ourselves first, we're horrible people. At the same time, plenty are the messages suggesting us to love ourselves first. So what is it? I think it's a call to move on from this simplistic view of things, and particularly of narcissism, to understand that there can be some good among all the bad. As we will see, having certain types of narcissism in certain types of context may be adaptive. But why would you care if you're not one? Well, this is not all about you. But most importantly, because narcissism seems to be on the rise. It may well be true that narcissism levels are increasing with each passing generation, both in Eastern and Western societies, and we should worry about it. Or it may just be that narcissism is becoming more prevalent, more accepted, more normalized, and we should also worry about it. And at this rate, one day, we may all become narcissists. In that case, it's better to understand what it is and how to make the most out of it. And like of many of you here, I didn't know much about narcissism myself, only that it was a bad thing. And it wasn't until I started my psychology degree that I quickly realized that everything I thought I knew about people well, what's wrong? So here's a few things I've learned about narcissism. Narcissism as such is a personality trait called subclinical narcissism, which we all possess to certain levels. It's typically defined as an unrealistically overinflated sense of self, or in simpler terms, an excessive self-esteem. Of course, there are many other characteristics, but these vary with each different type of narcissism, because I've also learned there are different types, which vary on the basis of the level of selfishness and on the level of psychopathological risk. So I was quite surprised to find that there are communal narcissists. These are quite the superheroes. They boost their self-esteem by helping others. But the interest fell on two other types, which are the following. Grandiose narcissists, they think they're the best. They want you to recognize they are. They love attention. They're charismatic, sociable, extroverted, assertive, and frankly, quite bossy. Celebrities, politicians, businessmen, some people in positions of high power may display grandiose narcissistic traits. On the other end, we have vulnerable narcissists. These are shy and introverted, but deep down they know they deserve and are entitled to things. Their fragility and unstable self-esteem makes them very sensitive to others' opinions, to the development of psychopathology and antisocial behavior when threatened. These guys play it tough just to mask their insecurity. And when these two merge together and are led to the very extreme, 
is when people develop narcissistic personality disorder. It's a clinical and dangerous condition. It's typically represented by your prototypical selfish and abusive narcissist. Luckily, there's only 1 and 2% of the population that actually experience that. And hopefully, they're receiving the treatment they require. So we can see that there are bad things, but there are also some good characteristics. As we will see, grandiose narcissists in particular may have some benefits. But first, let me recognize, relationships is not one of them. Narcissists in general don't make the best of friends nor the greatest of lovers. First, their charismatic personality is an asset. They, they have a lot of friends, they have a lot of lovers. But with time, their self-absorption and, let's be honest, not so nice behaviors may and do hurt others. And many suggest it's because of empathy, a dysfunctional empathy. On a positive note, it's not that they lack of it entirely, because they have high levels of emotional and social intelligence. So they are able to put themselves in someone's shoes, they just decide not to. So could empathy decrease this dark side of narcissism? Good news is yes, and many researchers are attempting this both in clinical and general populations. Self-awareness, meditation, and even the promotion of communal narcissism are potential avenues to foster empathy and improve their relationship. And this reminds me quite of drinking. We know it's not of the healthiest of behaviors. That's not gonna stop us tonight to get a couple glasses of wine. But we do it consciously and aware of its risks and how to avoid them. This is the same with narcissism. It's not about removing it entirely, but being aware there are risks that we need to reduce and benefits that we need to promote. But if you're still one of the skeptics, I'm sure you're probably thinking, no, they will and even deserve to die sad and alone. Well, research suggests otherwise. Grandiose narcissists seem to have a longer lifespan, good levels of mental and physical well-being, and a greater life satisfaction. And this is not something that they have when they grow old, but it's something that they manifest in many different ways throughout their lifespan. For instance, their extroversion will make them resistant to social withdrawal. They constantly will seek relationships, and they will have multiple sources of support at multiple times. Also, their inflated beliefs about themselves will keep them active and engaged, involved in their lives. And they are able to keep active because they have good levels of physical health. Because if there's something we know about narcissists, it's that they love their exercise. And they love going to the gym. In fact, they're the ones that are posing in the mirror, taking selfies. But beyond all that, we find people who are actually taking care of their bodies, their appearance, their nutrition, and they truly commit to that. Whilst seemingly superficial and shallow, that is good because they're decreasing the risk of physical diseases, and they will maintain good levels of mental well-being. In fact, the relationship between narcissism and body image have been quite the studied topic, and researchers are now starting to agree that grandiose narcissistic personality traits may lead to a lower discrepancy between ideal and actual body, lower body shame, lower self-objectification, thus decreasing the risk of developing an eating disorder. And these are quite promising findings for us all. Body positivity movements are here for a reason, to make us feel comfortable in our own skin, but especially to be resistant to negative comments making us think otherwise making us insecure. So can you already see the pattern? Resilience, resistance, mental toughness. Having high levels of grandiose narcissism may be one of the pathways contributing to happiness, psychological functioning, resilience to negative feelings and negative experiences. And it seems to make sense. If you're awesome, if you think you're awesome, you may act like you're awesome, you may even become awesome. But most importantly, you will never think you're not. You'll be less likely to feel anxious, self-conscious, shameful, depressed. And this is exactly what we've been studying here in Queen's University. We focus on the relationship between narcissism and a variety of outcomes, particularly among university students. And we found that those students scoring high or above average on narcissistic traits actually also displayed 
high scores on mental toughness. Mental toughness is the ability to see challenges as opportunities, to persevere, to feel in control, to have high levels of confidence. And when these two are paired together, that leads to a higher academic achievement, better grades, because surely it takes a lot of confidence and commitment to make it through exams. These two are also responsible for decreasing the risk of psychiatric symptoms. We found that they accounted for lower levels of depression, anxiety, perceived stress, neuroticism, and it didn't come much as a surprise, because unlike their vulnerable counterparts, who are at high risk of all of the above, grandiose narcissism are often referred as thick skin. The higher their confidence, the higher the resistance. So everything started to point out quite a bright side of narcissism. And this trait is so central that it can act as a bridge between the positive and prosocial side of personality and its darkest. If we nurture a positive and healthy expression of narcissism, we are able to decrease its most negative behaviors. We're able to decrease the levels of Machiavellianism, manipulation, exploitation. We're able to decrease the level of psychopathy, antisocial behavior, and lack of remorse. So moderate expression of grandiose narcissism can actually be useful in certain situations. For example, the one today, would I ever thought I would be standing here? No. Did I have reasons to think that? Plenty. Not only I'm not really used to talk much to people, let alone so many, this is not even my first language. And I know and I'm aware that sometimes when I try to explain things, it don't really make much sense. And even up to this point, I'm not even able to pronounce narcissism correctly. It would have been useful a few years back when I came here to study university. It would have helped me not to feel insecure, self-conscious, to withdraw from people at a time that I felt most alone. I wouldn't have felt anxious, worried or scared of how people may react, what they would think, will I ever fit in? And there's so many reasons in today's society we may all feel this way. We live in a society that keeps us and puts us in constant pressure to achieve, to be successful, to be good looking, to have money. And we're surrounded by social media platforms promoting these exact same things. With that, it also comes bullying, negative comments, depression, anxiety, strive for perfection. These are on the rise. Narcissism is on the rise and neither seem to be going away anytime soon. So what would happen the day we all become narcissists? Maybe we would be more resistant. Maybe we wouldn't. So is that, it's up to us now, now that as narcissism rises, so does the need for love, empathy, and compassion. Now it's the best time to ensure that if that reality ever happens, we make it a brighter reality. Thank you. What a great talk that was. Our next speaker is another acknowledged expert in his field. Greg Keith is an academic and urban designer with over 30 years experience in sustainability, energy use, and the impact of the design of the built form and the urban space. He is professor of sustainable architecture and the head of the School of Natural and Built Environment at Queen's. Greg has extensive experience of working closely with architects and planners to develop exciting ways of reinvigorating the city through the application of innovative, sustainable technologies, informing his work on sustainable city as a synergistic superorganism. Ladies and gentlemen, I welcome Professor Greg Keith with his TEDx talks, accelerating the decarbonisation of neighbourhoods. Hi, my name is Greg Keith. I'm Professor of Architecture and Urbanism and Head of the School of Natural Built Environment at Queen's. I'm going to talk to you today about a project that looks at decarbonising neighbourhoods uh, around Europe. The project's called Citizen and um, like all good projects, it started an idea in a pub 
we were in a bar in Brussels, and I was getting frustrated about the lack of action in changing our world. And so I had this idea that I'd make a little team of friends and we'd go around the world, around Europe at least, and engage with different communities and try and encourage them to change their lifestyle and their habits. And we went and got funding from the EU and through Framework 7 program. And we went to 10 cities around Europe and looked at how to change how they function and make them sustainable. And why do we need to do that? Well, obviously, on this graph, you can see the carbon and, and the ecological footprint of cities and the carrying capacity of the Earth at around about 1.8 on the scale. And you can see that most countries in the world are unsustainable. And this isn't just damaging for our lifestyles. It's damaging for future lifestyles. And to change this, we're going to have to have a really exciting brand new future. And I suppose one of the questions we're going to ask is, what's the best way to predict that future? Well, I think the first thing we have to do is engage with people. And people live in places, so places are really important. And so we go out and we set up the road show. It lasts for a week. We turn up in the city and we try and really kickstart change in, in a neighborhood in the city to show them how they can really get involved and really change the city. And the first things we, we do really is we define the problem. And so we calculate how much carbon each household in the neighborhood generates. And it's really interesting. 12.37 tons here for Nicosia in Cyprus. And that doesn't really mean anything to me. You know, so what we try and do is we try and visualize that in a way that makes sense to people. So what we do is we turn that into the amount of forest that you need, the area of forest you need in order to sequester that carbon as the forest was growing. And so in Nicosia, each household needs around about one and a half football pitches of forest. And when you start to look at, say, the central Nicosia, where we did a really interesting project, it's quite impressive how big the forest is. It's massive. It's 80 times the size of the neighborhood. Absolutely incredible. And obviously not easy to accommodate in the, in the surroundings of the city. <clears throat> so it's interesting when you look at the breakdown of that, that it's basically a mixture of electricity use, heating, mobilities, that's the getting around by car, and bus and so forth, and then the outputs of waste and water from the city. And so each city is different on this, but as you can see with Nicosia, we've got about 37% is electricity, mainly due to the high cooling loads from the, from, because it's a very warm place, but the mobility is really high because it's a very car orientated city. And cars are the killer in these models. Um, every city we went to, they're overroaded, they're overcarred. The car has been allowed to run riot in the city. And the first thing we have to do is reconfigure the urban situation to reduce the car usage by encouraging people to use buses and get on bikes and walk. And the interesting thing about that is, as you can see, it not only reduces the carbon, but it creates incredible spaces. Once we take the car out of these neighborhoods, we start to make space for people again, that where kids can play, where people can enjoy themselves, where they can meet and do things. And that's one of the really exciting things about this decarbonization. It, it, it's an and, and, and situation. It not only improves what we do, but it also changes the way we live. And then we start to look at the buildings. We look at how to reduce the energy use. We insulate them. We, in this case, we um, put planted facades on the buildings to keep them cool. We put a shaded roof on, on the top to keep the heat down. And then we look at how to use other energy sources in the city. This is Roslera in Belgium. An amazing amount of waste heat was available from the industrial processes outside the, outside the town. And so we envisaged a heat grid that brought heat to neighborhoods that needed heat. And in this case, there's actually three different heat grids of different temperatures supplying um, heating energy around the city. And then we do that also on a small scale. We have this thing called synergetic exchange where we, where we imagine buildings 
who can overproduce electricity, supplying it to ones that need electricity, ones that produce heat, supplying it to other buildings. And this can make a massive difference to the way things work. And then we look at how to change the way we produce the energy. At the moment, most of the energy in most of the towns is 90% produced by fossil fuels. And so we look at all the different technologies we've got available and how we might implement those in the neighborhood. One particular one here is, is using um, geothermal energy as a, um, a way of heating the town. And then in this case, we're using solar powered um, ground source heat pumps to store energy from summer in the ground and then um, retrieving that in winter when there isn't so much um, heat around. And these things are really exciting things. We also look at the way we use um, waste and we collect water so we can change the, the way the building functions on a small scale. And, and finally, we work with nature to climate proof the city to make a resilient infrastructure to stop flooding. This is in Roslera here. We changed the, the culvert that ran through the, the town into a, a sort of biodiverse um, flood proof system, which also allowed for people to get around the city without going on roads. And then that's the last thing we do really in terms of the, the um, technical systems. But we also try and inspire people to, to enjoy the new lifestyles. We, we, we create these pen pictures of people that show how they could live in the new town. And people are really inspired by these things. And, and, and it really helps to, to change the neighborhood's view about, about how much they need to change and, and, and why it's worth doing. And then we use this amazing Pac-Man game where we start with the forest and we, we have a little Pac-Man that goes around and, and each time we make a move in the city, it eats a bit of this virtual forest that we've created until eventually we've added all these different technologies and, and spatial interactions until the forest is so small it can fit inside the city itself and we become carbon neutral. And then from that amazing plan, which has taken only four days, we create a time-bound plan of change, which shows a series of interventions that each neighborhood can make in order to achieve its goals. And then on the Friday of the week, we, we present this beautiful, shiny future to the city. And it's really interesting when we present that, because we present it to the city, and the first question the city council asks is, this is great, but what's the cost of doing it? And it's really interesting because the stakeholders in the neighborhood who've never had a voice before answer the question. They say, what's the cost of not doing it? And that really is the change that we need. We realize that these changes, they make a difference socially economically and climatically to the neighborhood and people buy into that and once people buy into things they can make change so I asked at the start what's the best way to predict the future well as Buckminster Fuller said the best way to predict the future is to design it thank you our next speaker is a former mountain leader military leader tech startup entrepreneur C-suite member and university professor, Dr. Matthew Anderson belongs in a world of transformation and disruption. Currently a research fellow in the School of Chemistry and Chemical Engineering, he is also a junk professor of disruptive leadership at Kedge Business School in Paris. His mission is to simulate positive change in a rapidly changing world by helping our leaders and their businesses to evolve, by reconsidering what really matters the most and he is willing to accompany them on their journey. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Dr. Matthew Anderson with his TEDx talk, How Leaders Win and Lose the Transformative Power of Trust. Leadership is not limited to just Homo sapiens. It plays out in the animal world, we know this. But if we were to identify maybe a unique feature on the evolutionary landscape where humans appear distinct, that might be in shared intentionality. You see, it's rather odd that humans would work with, support, defend, sacrifice for others who are not blood relatives or even our own species. But we have 
uniquely evolved, a way of getting people, often strangers or even adversaries, to work together, to work for us, not against or without us. And given this shared intentionality, how is it that we can cooperate successfully across diverse and often malaligned social groups to the mutual benefit of all members? The answer is trust. And for leaders, trust is the cash flow of shared intentionality. Discovering just how vital trust is was the surprising finding from research we conducted into how organizations lead change and transformation during the global pandemic. The theme of trust emerged as, as significant. We interviewed nearly 150 mid and senior level leaders across retail and energy sectors, and almost all of them in some way recognized the same six factors in winning and losing trust in the organizations. There were three negative factors, inconsistency, weird self-interest, and attending the 1%, and three positive factors, which were courageous empathy and compassion, real conversations, and serotonin hits. So let's go through this. Factor one, inconsistency. The fact is, in change, most leaders are frequently sending mixed messages to their teams and their colleagues. Mixed messages about strategy, about priorities, about goals, career opportunities, resource allocations. Most leaders assume charity from their teams and colleagues with a, it's just out of my control excuse. However, this is actually misplaced because a leader's equity of trust may actually gradually devalue without them even being aware of it, like a slow fall. But there is hope. Activities we saw that alleviated inconsistency were things like one voice presentations, where normally siloed businesses will communicate together publicly, or setting the record straight Q&A plenaries, or reimagining transparent processes for career opportunities or resource sharing, and things like control-alt-delete exercises, where old corporate messaging is just erased. Factor two, weird self-interest. We saw a cultural smoking gun in weird Western world. By weird, I mean Western, educated, industrialized, rich, democratic, where the ethic of autonomy tended to place individual interests or values as paramount, assuming we are autonomous selves, empowered and engaged to own our own careers and futures. It's a very Western view and hugely valid at individual level. But it tends to dissolve altruism and service mindset a little bit higher up and raises a natural barrier, maybe born of self-preservation, that seems to counteract trust. When we observed organizations during the pandemic, we frequently saw leaders not sharing in the privations of their team. Privations like reduced working hours, reduced pay and bonuses. In fact, maybe a minor example, but many leaders continued to turn up to the office suited and booted whilst their teams were at home in sweatpants, wrestling with new laptops, new digital platforms, and new ways of working, uh, whilst juggling kids, cats, and more calories. But what we noticed was to sustain trust, leaders can't sustain privilege. But there is hope again. We saw things like driving environmental, social, and sustainability issues to the top of the agenda worked. We saw create, creating altruism awards worked. And we saw increasing the diversity and promotions and, and succession plans seem to mitigate that negative self-interest. Okay, factor three, attending the 1%. 99% of the time, team members do an adequate job. They get it done, unnoticed, often producing good or even excellent results. But 1% of the time, things go awry and it's not good enough. In change, this is often when the leaders interact most with the team via the 1% deviance of expectation. This focused attention on shortcomings undermines leader member trust as members experience what we call in psychology automatic vigilance. It has the mental state of failure and people start hiding. Okay, so that, those were the negative three factors. Now the positive factors. Factor four, courageous empathy and compassion. There are few things as critical in leadership as an empathy. The power of empathy for generating trust is found in a leader's ability to show concern for people's plights and problems and to understand the dynamic of expectations by which to adapt their actions. But stepping out with empathy as a leader requires real courage. Courage to ask questions like, what do people expect to see from me? How do they individually and collectively wish to be seen? We notice that answers to these questions can be surprising and unexpected. One story from an engineering company described how on Zoom virtual meetings, 
certain members of the team felt vulnerable or even embarrassed about the perceived size of their apartment. And that meant that they would not turn their cameras on during the calls. It took the leaders some delicate digging to uncover this and resolve it by providing the team with a digital image background for them all to apply. Suddenly, all team members were joining with the cameras on, subtly done. This example and many like it showed that empathy should be accompanied by compassion. Specifically, we must learn to be gentle and caring in how we do things, not just what we do, but how we do it. Okay, factor five, real conversations. It's clear leaders must be experts in engaging in real conversations with their colleagues and peers. They must create what is called emotional and cognitive proximity through shared language and emotive labeling of events and experiences. Indeed, conversations between people has a chemistry. In neuroscience, it's called synchronicity, whereby simply telling a story, one person transplants ideas and emotions into the other's brain. These real conversations are not just feedback culture. They're not just 360. It's much more than that. It's about giving people the power to express their feelings one to another in ways that strengthen relationship for the purposes of searching for the feel-good state, the safe space, the mental space where we can both inhabit without anxiety. One global energy business had an ambition to ignite a group-wide entrepreneurship spirit. They'd invested heavily in programs, deployed technologies and people, but the change narrative from the town halls they were having just wasn't sticking. It lacked translation and relevance. For them, the big shift was stop dictating to the global population and empower the regions and markets to drive their own real change narratives. Trust them to explore new ways of working, prioritize their own ideas, and challenge the value chain of their own work activities. But creating that real conversations at local levels was in fact the priority. Okay, factor six, serotonin hits through targeted praise and recognition. It's no surprise that the most powerful positive means for creating trust is frequent and specific praise and recognition. By that I mean praise linked to actual work outputs and performance, not generic and unattributable ones. These serotonin hits should traverse collective to individual, applying like a continuum of tools from verbal praise to financial rewards, and creativity in the continuum is key. Also, praise and recognition should be public where possible. Tell stories, and recipients should be selected without prejudice. Don't just select from the end team. Select from diverse social groupings, gender, culture, and race. You see, later, leaders praising and recognizing team and peers reaffirms a sense of belonging, a desire to win together. It gives members something positive to trust in, an acknowledgement of good works, a sense that we're winning something, no matter how small that is. These serotonin hits are vital for sustaining the competitive mindset, and it's where the growth happens, both at human and at business levels. One thing we spotted loud and clear in all the stories we heard was that when you have trust, you acquire the potential for one team. Interests coalesce, me becomes we, and trust is the nexus. That was the sure thing. It wasn't something we'd looked out for, but it was clear that successful change and transformation starts from there. It starts from the we, it starts from shared intentionality and trust. With these findings, I'm sure it will help organizations engineer themselves a much more sustainable, whether it's pandemic or energy transition, and much more successful future that's much more engaged with the workforce through the medium of trust. Our penultimate speaker is Queen's alumna and a previous member of staff. Katrina Thompson is an aeronautical engineer with 30 years of engineering experience in a broad range of sectors across offshore, telecommunications, aerospace and marine. The consistent theme of her work is a passion for numerical methods and analysis. Katrina works for Artemis Technologies. She's a technical coordinator for the Strength in Places programme that is focused on decarbonising zero emissions passenger ferries. I bet you can't guess what her talk is about. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Katrina Thompson with Flying Boats, the race to decarbonize maritime transportation. Hi, 
My name's Katrina Thompson. As a child growing up in Belfast in Northern Ireland, the rich maritime heritage of the area was a big part of my life. My family are from the heart of Sailor Town, and my father and his family made their living at the docks and on the sea. But I was looking to the skies instead of the seas, so I decided to become an aeronautical engineer. My journey has now brought me back to the sea as head of research in a technology company, which has spun out from an America's Cup yacht racing team. Here, engineers from automotive, aerospace and maritime have come together to tackle the problem of climate change. Now, you might be thinking that these industries are a big part of the problem, but we believe that our combined experience, skills and strengths can be used to make a massive impact in this area. Just earlier this year, Sir David King, a former UK chief scientist, said that he believes that what we do over the next three to four years is going to determine the future of humanity. So clearly, we need to move quickly. In the race to net zero, we are entering a transformative era in how we travel over land, sea and air. For the last 100 years, the shape of our vehicles have remained very similar. A plane still has two wings, a car still has four wheels, and a boat still has a hull in the water. Ask any kid to draw a boat and it will likely have a funnel billowing smoke. I know mine always did. However, over the next few minutes, I want to talk about why the design of the next generation of boats is about to change dramatically and why children all around the world will start to draw a very different type of boat. A really cool, high speed, zero emissions boat that looks more like a cross between a boat and a plane, because it has wings. Before I get into that though, let's think about the problem we are trying to solve. Maritime transportation emits approximately 1 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide annually. As a sector, we're responsible for 2.5% of global greenhouse emissions and around 30% of these emissions came from the global domestic operations. In other words, those boats and ferries close to our shores and in our rivers and lakes. We therefore need urgent action to reduce maritime emissions. But as an industry, we have in the past been slow to innovate. We're playing catch up now with the likes of the more agile automotive industry who've been doing a great job. What makes the problem really difficult is that water is a very dense fluid, 830 times more dense than air. So it takes a lot of energy to move a boat through the water. This is why current zero emission electric boats have a very limited range and commercial take up has been slow. Just like with electric cars, range anxiety can be a real issue. It's a big enough worry that you'll run out of charge in an electric car, but running out of energy on the water would be so much worse. There are no hard shoulders in the sea. Clearly, we need to solve these problems and solve them quickly. And we have an idea worth spreading that will do just that. We are designing a family of high-speed zero-emission boats that combine America's Cup hydrofoils, which are basically the wings under the water, with an optimized Formula One electric drivetrain. This will literally allow us to fly the boat over the waves. By pulling the boat hull out of the water, we reduce the drag by a factor of 10. Now, What's really exciting about these new boats is not just that they're zero emissions with an extended range, but because we fly above the waves, the ride comfort is fantastic. Seasickness will be a thing of the past. Have you ever been in a harbour when you see a ferry pulling in? If you have, you'll have noticed the tiny boats bobbing up and down by the waves that come off the ferry's hull. That's called a wake. Well, Despite traveling at high speeds, these new boats have hardly any wake, so they can operate at full speed at all times without worrying about riverbank erosion or disturbing other boats. What's more, with no fuel on board or noisy combustion engines, the boat is super quiet. It doesn't stink of diesel fumes. It will be a totally different travel experience. And we don't forget about the first and the last mile of our journeys. 
The boats are designed with charging and storage for electric bikes and scooters to allow you to make your whole journey emission free. Now, we're not doing this alone. Collaboration is a key component of our solution and we're leading a Belfast based group of 13 expert partners called the Belfast Maritime Consortium to help deliver on our vision. Together, we believe that we can make a major impact on climate change. But as I've said before, this is a race to net zero. So how do we get this new boat to the market quickly, but in a way that doesn't generate even more environmental problems? Well, we think the answer lies in looking at the engineering process itself. Typically in engineering, things get designed, tested and reworked. It's a very expensive and wasteful process. We believe a more sustainable way is to use a digital twin. A digital twin is simply a virtual digital model of the real physical thing. And in our case, it's a digital model of a transformative flying boat. This allows us to fast track the time it takes to go from a great idea like this to a ready to launch product. It's quicker, cheaper, and more sustainable. We believe that this is how we fast track the race to help decarbonize maritime transportation and play our part to help save the planet while making seasickness, engine noise and fuel fumes a thing of the past. So my hope is that one day, very soon, the kids are drawing boats that look more like this. Then we will know that we have truly been successful in our mission and that we will have taken action that will make a difference to everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Katrina. And now for our final talk of this afternoon. Anastasia Perisinakis is a multi-award winning engineer and entrepreneur. She's the CEO of Clio Tech, a startup she co-founded while studying at Queen's. Through her company, she is working to address shortfalls within the social care sector. Inspired by caring for her disabled brother and the 10 years she has worked as a healthcare assistant. Anastasia is currently studying towards an M in chemical engineering at Queen's, whilst also working in the manufacturing business office at Jaguar Land Rover focusing on strategic process improvement. Ladies and gentlemen, for our final TEDx talk at TEDx Queen's University Belfast, Engineering Our Sustainable Future, I present to you our student, Anastasia Perisinakis, with her talk, People-Centred Engineers Will Fix the Health and Social Care Crisis. Family has never owned a dog. My brother is on the upper end of the autistic spectrum and he's terrified of animals, so I never really related to my friends when they would ask questions such as, who's gonna look after my dog when we're gone during the summer holidays? It wasn't until I was a little bit older that I realized that they probably found it really strange when my parents couldn't come to my netball matches because we couldn't find anyone to look after my grown brother. He needed two adults with him at all times. I remember feeling so angry because my brother couldn't function in this world, or rather, this world was not designed to allow him to function at all. The sound of loud cars, the feeling of rain on his clothes, even going to the toilet in public when it was already occupied. We couldn't even go for a walk because if someone got in the way of his perfect straight line, it would cause World War III. If it wasn't for the carers that would look after my brother for two hours a week, my family would never have ever left the house. I remember the first time that we went to the cinema and we weren't asked to immediately leave. It was one of the best days of my life. Those two hours were everything. So as soon as I was old enough, I wanted to give those two hours back to another family. I became obsessed with learning everything I could about the care system. I started working in a chronic care setting alongside my A-levels. I was looking after adults with acquired brain injuries and autism and dementia. I was feeding them and caring for them. I was looking after their finances and taking them shopping. 
I was showering them. I was even sleeping in the room next door to them to make sure that if they had a seizure, they weren't unattended. And I loved doing all those things. But when the UCAS deadlines came around, I did not choose nursing or medicine as my career choice. I loved science and maths. I loved looking after people, but I just couldn't imagine myself in a care setting because my experiences were very difficult to reconcile. I was always exhausted because we were always understaffed and I was emotionally broken because I didn't have the tools I needed to do my job properly. And I was anxious all the time because carers are blamed for everything that could go wrong. And even then, even after all that, after keeping people alive and healthy, I didn't have enough money in my bank account to pay for my car insurance. So because I liked science and maths and looking after people, and being able to pay for my car insurance, I picked engineering. The problem with engineering is that whilst I was sat in my lectures learning amazing things like how to take, turn cow manure into jet fuel, I couldn't help but feeling sick in my stomach at the thought of my patients alone without me. Not just because I knew exactly how they liked their tea or which Doris Day song was their favorite, but because when I left my last shift at my last care home, I left one nurse alone with 32 other patients. 32 patients who needed cleaning and washing and feeding and care and attention. If you're a carer and you're watching this, I'm so sorry. You know exactly what I'm talking about and the system is broken. In the report conducted by Unison, 54% of carers were found to have been overworking without pay. A famous quote reads, a true test of a civilization is how it treats its most vulnerable members. But by 2041, over a quarter of people in the UK will be 65 and over. And even then, Disability rates are skyrocketing alongside that. And despite over 10% of the UK's workforce already working in social care, do you know how many people who have the audacity to ask for long-term care actually get it? 25%. The system is broken. And I actually even failed my second year of university completely because I had my own medical problems. I had no confidence. I was at rock bottom. It was actually my professor at the time that asked me to speak today. But back then, I was asking him for help on dropping out of university. I had no faith in myself, and I couldn't see how my course could help me help other people. But I'm so glad my professor had faith in me and convinced me to carry on and retake the year. But I needed to survive on my year out, so I went back to working in chronic care 80 hours a week. And I was so depressed because the problems I had faced years before were still there. I remember sitting in a care home thinking, somebody out there must be doing something about this. And that's when I came across a report released by the Royal Academy of Engineers called Engineering Better Care. It was incredible. It had photos of engineers talking with care professionals and trying to figure out how the system worked and how to improve it, exactly like I had done for years. It was talking about using engineering principles that I was learning about in university, such as value stream mapping and process improvement through a logical lens and even failure mode analysis to fix things for vulnerable people. And it made sense because engineers are taught how to define very clear problem statements and then to drill down to root cause and fix that root cause so that that problem never persists. That report married my strengths and my passions. It reminded me that I was not supposed to sit in a corner solving equations. I was supposed to be solving problems because engineers are here to help people. I had a new passion and a new reason to carry on with my degree. So I decided I was never going to fail an exam again. And I put my head down and I aced every exam afterwards, even during a global pandemic. And it was during this pandemic that I had called my best friend, Molly, who was a medical student at my university and a carer during a time of the highest hospital admissions in COVID-19. All she could tell me was how defeated she felt and I was heartbroken for her. So I frantically researched 
anything that I could find on engineering solutions that could possibly help my friend because I thought back to that report by the Royal Academy of Engineers. And to my surprise, I had found a group of engineers at the Cambridge Institute for Manufacture who had used their whole master's degree to model patient flow to make sure that COVID testing at local hospitals was optimized. They had seen a problem and decided to fix it, which is what engineers do. So I called Molly back and I said, Molly, I'm so sorry that you are going through this. The system is broken, so let's fix it. And to this day, I have no idea what came over us, but we got a team together and we decided to design a solution. And it worked because of my engineering background and her medical expertise and our first-hand experience of the problem. We took this solution to the Department of Health and they called it groundbreaking. And remember, I had been failing uni just a year earlier. I was planning to drop out and it was only recently that the Royal Academy of Engineers, the same people who released the report that I happened upon on my year of failure, they awarded me with a prestigious scholarship for leadership for this work. And it was only then that I realized what engineers could really do to help people. I met an engineer who was designing medical devices that were keeping babies alive. I met somebody who was designing breast pumps that women could hide in their clothes so they could still go to work and express. I met somebody who was designing healthcare access systems for people in rural Africa so they didn't have to walk for more than two hours just to see a doctor. Engineering became like a superpower to me. In a published lecture by the Cambridge Institute for Manufacture, Professor John Clarkson recounts a time when he was asked to design a care journey for a man nearing the end of his life. One of his team members asked a gut-wrenching question that serves as a poignant reminder of why we do what we do as engineers. They asked, who's gonna look after his dog when he's gone? Thank you. Thank you, Anastasia. What a strong, passionate message to conclude our event this afternoon. And that's it. Ladies and gentlemen, I can't believe that you've come to the end of our program. I think you will all agree that each and every speaker captured the spirit of TED in their own ways. Thought provoking, idea focused, and covering a wide range of topics. Our speakers have represented Queen's University Belfast and the Faculty of Engineering and Physical Sciences wonderfully. They've inspired us, illustrating with passion how each and every one of them in some ways is working towards a more sustainable future for us all. A huge thank you to our speakers, from all of us at Queen's University, from the organising team and from the audience at home for the work that each of you have put into to prepare and deliver such a wide range of fascinating presentations. And finally, a huge thank you to you at home for watching wherever you are in the world. We sincerely hope that you've enjoyed our digital TEDx event. We certainly have enjoyed making it and look forward to many more TEDx Queen's University Belfast events, both online and we hope in person in the near future. Continue please to get involved at hashtag TEDxQUB on social media. Keep an eye too for the, on the university website where the videos of each of the individual contributions will be posted in the coming days. All that remains for me is to say a big thank you again. Um, it's been my pleasure and goodbye.